Scizor, the pincer Pokémon versus Heracross, the single horn Pokémon. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional and I hope you are too. Today we will be racing these two Pokémon head-to-head -head in solo playthroughs of Pokémon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite Four, to determine who is the most powerful bipedal bug. I've run Scyther vs. Pinsir in the past, and I see this run being very similar. Scizor and Heracross, after all, feel very much like the Gen 2 equivalents of those two. Their growth rates align, movesets are similar, and this time both competitors face a 4 times weakness in the game. Scizor to fire, and Heracross to flying. Our focus remains on the Gen 2 bugs today, but at the end of the video I will include Scyther and Pinsir's times because I love me some data points. Gathering more data and creating more subsets of Pokémon is so much fun! As always, we begin by rolling a die. Today, let's go with 1 to 10 for Heracross and 11 to 20 for Scizor. Lucky number 7, I choose you, Heracross! <laughs> The first thing to discuss are my challenge rules. There are further details in the description, but my general rules are I can only use my starter in battle, no items in trainer battles except held items, no glitches, exploits, or RNG manipulations, and I don't particularly like accuracy or evasion strategies, so I will tend to avoid them. In addition to that, in my versus videos, I start with my challengers fully evolved, where applicable, as well as with the option of a single egg move. It's been requested in the comments lately that I start including the egg move options in my versus videos. I'll take a quick aside to thank everyone who gives suggestions in the comments and premiere chat. They really help me improve the quality of my content. Heracross's egg moves are quite limited, but I feel like the best option of the four is Bide. I'll get to why in a minute. We snag our Heracross from Professor Oak and nickname it Hercules. I have two reasons for this. One, Hercules is knowing for being formidably strong, and two, Heracross's sprite is based off of the Hercules Beetle. Speaking of formidable, look at the base attack stat, 125 with a base speed of 85 to back it up. This makes us fast and strong, trouncing the rival in the lab. Were it not for my rule set though, Hercules would have a problem. We obviously have no issue carving through the first section of the game. It's full of first stage Pokémon with base stat totals of less than half of ours. Our problem lies at our first gym leader, Brock. Heracross's Reflection Pinsir from my Gen 1 race learned Seismic Toss at level 13 which solved Brock. Today, Hercules gets... Well, nothing. Our best option until level 23 is Horn Attack, which we learn at level 6. We can use it to crush our way through Viridian Forest, leveling up to 10 before entering Pewter City to challenge our first gym leader. Hercules is part of the slow growth rate, meaning that it takes the most experience to level up. One and a quarter million experience in total at level 100. As such, grinding to level 23 for Brick Break would be awful against level 3 Rattatas. Horn Attack isn't doing much to Geodude, but let's switch to Bide. Bide will absorb the damage you take for 2-3 to three turns, paying it back double on the last turn. In this battle, Geodude got a crit, and I feel like that just tipped the odds out of our favor, as Onyx is able to deal far more damage, taking Hercules out for our first reset. There were a lot of changes made to Bide over the first generations, and I found some conflicting literature. I thought it still bypassed accuracy checks, but in Gen 2 they changed that, giving Bide a chance to miss, similar to other damage reflection moves like Counter or Mirror Coat. Speedrunner0218 pointed this out to me originally, leaning on his suffering from playing his Wobbuffet vs. Shedinja race in Leaf Green. If you're looking for more Pokemon content, be sure to check out his channel. I'll leave a link in the description. In the second Brock attempt the stars align and we manage to deal back enough damage with a 3 turn bide to knock out Onyx. We collect our first badge at 6 minutes and 6 seconds, much, much faster than if we didn't have the option for the egg move. On my way through Mount Moon, I grab the Dome Fossil. What can I say, every time I choose the Helix Fossil, I get a weird little headache for some reason. Heracross is another Pokémon that I don't fully understand not being able to learn either Mega Punch or Mega Kick. Surely he can... oh, never mind. With our slow growth rate, I'm only level 14 coming into Cerulean City, so I quickly defeat Swimmer Luis and Misty's Gym to level to 15 before challenging Rival 2. We received TM39 Rock Tomb from Brock, teaching it immediately upon receiving it. I can use it as a great coverage move, dealing three quarters to Pidgeotto and lowering its speed, but I take a sand attack. 
Rock Tomb's disadvantage is that it's only 80% accurate, and combined with Sand Attack, we miss, opening us up to our second problem. As a bug-fighting Pokémon, we're four times weak to flying types, with Wing Attack hitting for two-thirds. Our third Rock Tomb connects, taking him down, but we could be in trouble here. The rival's Ace Charmander is next, with us missing twice and getting taken out for our second reset. And now, witness a battle in which we don't miss. It goes much differently. The Charmander team felt like the best choice against Heracross. Once he's fully evolved to Charizard, he's both a fire and flying type, not to mention super fast. I felt like that made it the most challenging team for Hercules to face. Being able to one-shot his Charmander was a nice perk, with his Rattata and Abra in the back posing very little threat. As I continue along the next route to help Bill, I want to take a moment to let you in on my process when performing these runs. I start with a blind playthrough, doing a cursory look at the Pokémon's learn sets, typically coming up with a vague plan while building my next overlay. I want to push the limits, doing as few additional battles as I can. Once I determine what, why, where, when, and how a Pokémon is getting stuck throughout a playthrough, I attempt to optimize it and do a second playthrough of the game. I'm far from perfect, but I feel this gives a more fair comparison when assessing real-time completion which is the metric that I place the most weight on. I'm out of PP, so I heal in the Poke Center and let's challenge our second gym leader. I have three strategies coming into this battle. One, our physical might gives us enough of an edge alone. Or two, Bide ends up being useful a second time. It seems like strategy one might be a go as Horn Attack gets the Oko or one hit knockout against Staryu. I correctly predict that Starmie will outspeed us going for Rock Tomb turn one, getting hit by a critical water pulse for less than half. Okay, my confidence is up now. Now, outspeeding, we take control of the battle with Horn Attack. Oh wait, did I say that there were three strategies? Well, the third involved my hit points hitting zero, but I prefer to keep it real and stay positive. That's a math joke. We head south to Vermilion City and find ourselves quickly on the SSN. The only item collection I'm gonna be doing here is grabbing the trash can berries as I will not be grabbing my army of Meowths with Hercules. I head to the upper deck and it's time to face Rival 3. With our level being proportionally much higher to the Rival's team than last time, this battle goes much smoother than Rival 2. We now one-shot Pidgeotto, avoiding all shenanigans. We also outspeed and then Oko Kadabra, bringing out Charmeleon. We miss the one-shot getting hit with Smokescreen. That causes us to miss our next horn attack while Charmeleon responds with a stab or same type attack bonus, super effective, blaze boosted, Ember, also getting a burn. Ooh, a burn you say? Well, this just got interesting. I clean up the rival leveling to 23 and learning Brick Break. Why am I so excited about a burn, you may ask? Well, Heracross's ability is Guts, and just like we saw in my recent Machamp video, Guts is pretty awesome. It increases our damage by 50% while suffering a major status ailment. I feel that burn is the best as it doesn't nuke our speed and consistency like paralysis, and we don't take overworld damage like with poison. Carrying a burn is super beneficial, but risky as we're taking a lot of additional damage in battle. But it makes the next gym battle an absolute cakewalk. Since we're burned, we can't be affected by a second major status ailment. This negates all of Surge's static and thunder wave strategies, but he's not even gonna make it there. Stab, guts boosted, brick break, levels his whole team, and with our fairly decent speed, we even outspeed Raichu in the back. Hercules collects an easy third badge, but let's check back with Scizor to see how it handles the first section of the game. Scizor is actually going to play quite differently in the early game compared to Hercules. For egg move options, Scizor gets quite a few more than Heracross. I was tempted by Silverwind, but given that the ability Technician doesn't exist until Generation 4, I have to stick with Swarm, which won't be doing much of anything for us this run. As such, I see our best option being, just like with Scyther, Reversal. Reversal hits with a base power that's inversely proportional to your current HP. That is to say, the more damage we take, the more damage Reversal will deal. Scizor is the bug and steel type, which is why I nicknamed it Tinsect. <laughs> I'm still giggling at that one. The steel typing provides us great defensive typing almost across the board, but we will suffer a four times weakness to the fire type. As such, I've once again chosen the rival's Charmander team to face. I feel it'll provide us the most challenge throughout the run. With Reversal on our side, I don't see Brock putting up much resistance, so I make a beeline straight to the gym, only defeating the mandatory trainer in Viridian Forest. Another great thing about the steel typing is that we're immune to poison. Gosh, it feels good not to constantly be worried about poison. <laughs> Thank you.
Tinsect enters the battle at only level 6. Our first damage increase with Reversal comes at around 70% health, so we're only striking with a base power of 20, but both Geodude and Onyx will be weak to it. Even at our low level, we resist Geodude's tackle and Reversal takes him down after only a few turns leveling us up twice to 8 over the next damage rounding threshold. Onyx joins the battle where I keep wailing away with reversals. On the last turn of battle, Onyx hits us to 20 HP, finally crossing into the 40 base power range of reversal. But it doesn't matter, as it was the last turn he's surviving anyway. We're moving on with our first badge early. On the way through Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil. I feel like it's rapidly becoming a trend that I'll grab the Helix Fossil only as much as I'm willing to experience this little headache. What dark magic is behind this? An advantage that Tinsec has over Hercules is that we're part of the medium fast growth rate as opposed to slow. As such, despite not clearing any additional trainers, we enter Cerulean at a higher level, ready to challenge Rival 2. Unlike Hercules, we do not get access to Rock Tomb, so we're going to be doing this battle with our natural strength. At level 15, it seems that Quick Attack will take 3 hits, which is unfortunate as Pidgeotto peppers us with Sand Attacks, causing a bunch of misses. We take him down, but at only 15 health, which does not bode well for Charmander. We then miss, and Ember deletes us. I'm gonna do something a little cheeky, leaning on a strategy that I came up with in my Scyther run. I'm really close to leveling up again, so I quickly go to the grass outside of Cerulean to level up to 16. The reason that I did this is because I'm not here to grind, I'm here to power up Reversal. I'm then using this Ekans to lower my hit points. The reason I leveled up is because I may need to be at the highest range of damage for Reversal, meaning we need to be at either 1 or 2 HP, or below 4%. If we got there and then leveled up, the increase in hit points could bump us into the other range and I'm not sure what I'm going to need here. At 4 HP I finish the battle, save, and head to Rival 2. At 4 HP we're in the second highest range at 150 base power compared to 200 in the highest range. I saved in the grass just in case I needed to reset and bump myself into that final range. Attempting the rival Gen in the 150 range though is all that we need. We one-shot Pidgeotto followed by Charmander and the rest of his team is an easy cleanup. A big advantage of being able to stick to that 150 range between 4 and 10% is that we give ourselves the safety against Rattata who knows priority quick attack. I leveled up gaining 3 HP and you can see that as Rattata goes for quick attack he does 3 damage. If we'd been at the lower HP there's a decent chance that I'd have lost here. I continue towards Bill's house where I'll be making sure to pull down Camper Flint to grab TM43 Secret Power a little early. As a 70 base power normal move, it's a great upgrade to Quick Attack which we've been using from the start at 40 base power. Secret Power also has the benefit of having a 30% chance of a secondary effect based on terrain. Most of the time that's going to be Paralysis. I continue along the path to rescue Bill with my sights set on our second gym leader, Misty. <laughs> I have my Persimberry equipped as we face down Misty. We have a decent enough special defense and no type weakness here. Oh, and we also hit like a truck, so I feel like the odds are in our favor. We one-shot Star You, bringing out the much more threatening Star Me. Water Pulse is hitting for around 20 damage, so we can take 4 of those, as our secret power is doing barely half. We get the Paralysis on the first turn, and that pretty much puts the battle in our hands. She heals a whole bunch, but we eventually take down Starmie, netting us our second badge. As I head south to Vermilion City after grabbing our HM cheerleaders and Army of Meowths, I'll let you in on my mindset going into this run. I'm not sure if I'm gonna need Hidden Power, but the Champion's Charizard in the late game is gonna be a big threat. As such, I've altered my IVs or individual values to have HP rock with a base power of 70. I'll try not to use it if I can avoid it, but I have the sneaking suspicion that the solution to the rival's Charizard is outspeed and one-shot him before he outspeeds and one-shots us. Hercules' IVs are perfect 31s across the board, in case you're wondering. On the SSN, there's nothing exciting for Tinsect aside from the trash can berries, so I come immediately to the upper deck to face Rival 3. I made the mistake of not healing so we could be in trouble here, with Secret Power taking out Pidgeotto in two while we take a bit of damage from Gust, leaving us at around a third for the rest of the battle. The rest of the battle is a short-lived statement as we miss the one-shot against Charmeleon getting taken down. Wait a minute, mistake of not healing, what am I saying? I have reversal! 
I make a super risky play here, using False Swipe to get Pidgeotto to whittle down our health a bit more before moving on to Charmeleon. The biggest risk here is getting hit by Sand Attack, but we only get hit by one as we take it out at 13 HP or around 18% putting us in the 100 base power range. We connect with Reversal against Charmeleon one-shotting and then take out Raticate with Secret Power. Kadabra is last and that Sand Attack really hurts us against him. We miss a whole bunch of times and he even confuses us with confusion. Thankfully, I still had on my Person Berry from Misty, so we're cured. That could have been bad, as we finally connect with Kadabra, taking him out with only 5 HP remaining. Whew, alright, let's go challenge Lieutenant Surge. I'm hoping that Surge will be a relatively straightforward battle, but that Raichu can be a real pain with some bad luck. His lead Voltorb and Pikachu get outsped and one-shot, bringing out his ace. I forgot to equip a Cherry Berry here, so he paralyzes us on the first turn while Secret Power hits for chunky damage, bringing him into Red Bar. Surge heals, but we connect with our next two hits, ending the battle. We level up to 26, learning Metal Claw, which is going to be a great option for us through the mid-game. Comparing our two competitors through the first three badges, we see that with Reversal on its side, Tinsect took an early lead, but because of Hercules' access to Rock Tomb, he's at an earlier time since, gaining and maintaining around a five-minute lead. This race is far from over, though, as we approach the mid-game. On Route 9, I'll be grabbing Aerial Ace for Tinsect. It's going to be a great coverage option in the upcoming section. On the other side of Rock Tunnel, I'll be heading straight south through Lavender Town to the Gatehouse. I'll be grabbing TM27 Return, a high PP powerful normal move giving us another great physical option through the mid-game. It strikes with a power based on your friendship with your Pokémon, capping at a base power of 102. We aren't quite there yet, but I'll be teaching it soon. We have more than enough attack, with our nature adamant, increasing attack and lowering special attack, as I didn't see us using many, if any, special moves. After clearing the rocket hideout, I've taught Aerial Ace and will now make my way towards Erika's gym. Now sporting a moveset of Metal Claw, Reversal, Return, and Aerial Ace, I defeat the trainers on the left-hand side of Erika's gym, focusing on the attack EVs. Aerial Ace is a 60 base power flying move that won't miss, giving us a fantastic option against grass Pokémon. With it on our side, it's time to challenge our fourth badge. <laughs> We have a Cherry Berry equipped as her lead Victory Bell loves using Stun Spore turn 1. We don't even give her the opportunity though as Tinsec outspeeds and uses super effective Aerial Ace to carve through her team. Speaking of speed, at only base 65 we will find ourselves struggling with it soon. It hasn't really been an issue thus far as we haven't faced many fully evolved Pokémon, but they're coming. Particularly the super speedy Charizard. We claim a quick fourth badge, so let's continue with that Rocket plotline. At the base of Pokémon Tower, Rival 4 stands in our way. I haven't discussed Metal Claw yet, but with Stab, it's a 75 power steel move with 95% accuracy. With 35 PP and very few typings that resist it, it works quite well as a tool against Rocket Fodder, but also boasts a 10% chance to increase our attack by one stage. Rival 4 is going easily enough until I misclick against Execute, allowing him to put us to sleep, Leech Seed us, then whittle us down a significant amount before we wakey wakey and take him down, but we're confused now too. Kadabra is out, and Tinsect hits herself in confusion for another reset. Should I really count that as a reset? I mean, I did knock myself out after all. I'm just kidding, of course it's a reset. If I click Aerial Ace instead of Reversal against Execute, the battle goes much smoother and we wipe out Rival 4, leveling to 35, one level away from Tinsect's game-changing move, Swords Dance. After clearing the tower, we're in Sylphco continuing the rocket plotline. I will be collecting the high-value items here as I want to dial in Tinsect's EVs as best I can with vitamins. Like I mentioned, I feel speed is going to be an issue in the not-too-distant future and we could sure use the Carbos. I'm not feeling super confident, but while we're here, let's give Rival 5 a shot. Rival 5 is the first time we encounter his starter fully evolved, and to be honest, I am scared of that Charizard. Pidgeot leads against us, but we're able to take him down with a single use of return. We don't lack the power, but this is the first time that we definitely lack the speed. Charizard outspeeds and destroys us with a single stab, four times super effective flamethrower. I try again, but that really isn't happening right now, so I visit the department store for my vitamins on the way to Fuchsia City. I need to outspeed that Charizard for a start, we'll deal with knocking it out after that. In Fuchsia, I clear the Safari Zone, and while I'm here, I'm gonna grab the Quick Claw. 
Since our speed is such a point of concern, it feels like a good idea to grab this as it gives us a 20% chance to move first while held. I'll take any edge that I can, but I doubt that I'm gonna need it coming into Koga. I mentioned learning Sword Stance at level 36 earlier, but I haven't gushed about it properly yet. It raises your attack by two stages in battle to a maximum of six. We barely need it as Return one-shots Koga's lead coughing. I set up two SDs against Muk while he uses Minimize. Lower your evasion all you want, my friend. Aerial Ace can't miss. Two take him down, and we're at plus four tripling our attack stat. Excessive? Perhaps. Fun? Absolutely. Koga's following coughing and Weezing stand no chance. We have a very low chance of losing this regardless, as the steel typing were immune to poison damage. His ace Weezing's best move against us is tackle, which we resist. We grab some XP and our fifth badge. We now have two options for progression, Rival 5 back in Silphco or Blaine on Cinnabar Island. Let's try Rival 5 again. I set up one SD against Pidgeot while he hits wing attack for a bit of damage. Charizard is out and we outspeed, getting the one shot with return. We're now on easy street for the rest of his team. I feel like this is going to be the interaction with the rival for the rest of the game though. Either we outspeed and win, or he outspeeds and wins. We're going to have an easy time against Sabrina, so we'll take her on next. What can I say? Tinsect has a lot of advantages in this battle. As the Steel Typer resists psychic damage and as a physical attacker, we will, we will rock her. All I have to do is tap A and return sweeps her team. No setup needed. We grab our sixth badge, but we have a bit of a daunting road ahead with our next gym badge being from Blaine, the fire type leader. I'm not feeling up to that quite yet, so let's go back and see how Hercules is handling the mid game. We step back into Hercules when he's right about to finish the rocket hideout below the game corner. We're about to see Hercules flexing against Giovanni, giving us a firm reminder of just how strong this beetle is. Stab super effective brick breaks destroy his Onyx and Rhyhorn, but when Kangaskhan hits the field, whoops, we're out of those. No problemo, I've got other options here, but wow, Mega Punch is doing a lot. Like, more than I can handle as Hercules gets knocked out. One ether later, and with a tummy full of humble pie, we defeat Giovanni. I don't feel like we're able to take on Erica reliably at the moment, electing to save her for after we gain a few more levels. The slow growth rate is definitely continuing to be a disadvantage for Hercules in this race. Coming into the rival 4 battle in Pokemon Tower, we can really see the difference. Granted, Tinsect did defeat Erica before coming here, but we were level 35. Hercules is only level 30 entering the battle, once again forgetting to heal. The thing is, Hercules is a beast, boasting a moveset of Brick Break, Return, Secret Power, and Rock Slide, which I learned while traveling through Rock Tunnel, we absolutely smash the rival's team. Hercules is also the adamant nature, because we doesn't need any of those silly special moves, our Mott will prove enough. Hercules will be following a similar route to Tinsect through the remainder of Pokemon Tower and Sylph Co. One big change is that while Tinsect gets early access to Sword Stance, Hercules does not until much later. We do, however, get access to TM8 Bulk Up, which I grabbed from the 7th floor on Sylph Co. during my item collection. While we're here, we're gonna try Rival 5 again. Before engaging him in battle, I'll take a quick moment to equip a Citrus Berry and use all the relevant vitamins that I've collected. This serves two purposes. It increases our stats and friendship, which further increases the damage of return. At level 36, we do outspeed Pidgeot, hitting Rock Slide, but only taking him to Deep Red Bar. Pidgeot fires back a stab, four times super effective critical wing attack, taking us out on turn one. Ouch. I jump right back in, and this time Rock Slide gets a better range, knocking out Pidgeot. Well, better range, crit, call it what you will. Pidgeot is outta here. Execute is next, who isn't that threatening, but we don't have a great answer for it. Return takes two shots to knock him out while he paralyzes us. Alright, it's all or nothing time. This Alakazam only knows Future Sight as a damaging move, so I set up two bulk ups. With the paralysis, we're stronger, but slower, and have a 25% chance to not do anything at all. It's all for naught though, as Charizard hits the field, outspeeding and wrecking us with Flamethrower. I reset twice more, but I have a feeling that there's a way through this. I now use one bulk up against Pidgeot while taking a four times super effective wing attack. Bulk up increases our attack and defense by one stage, so we're a slightly better equipped for that hit. Rock Slide then takes it out. I'm also rocking a Cherry Berry, but go for Brick Break turn one on the off chance that Execute uses Reflect. 
Everything goes to plan as we take down Execute status condition free. I don't bother with the setup against Alakazam going right for the knockout. We now outspeed Charizard hitting our own 4 times super effective hit with Rock Slide. Gyarados is then an easy cleanup. Hercules definitely has an advantage over Tinstec in that regard as we are a fair amount faster. Cool beans, with that out of the way I'm hungry for some badges so let's finish off the rockets and take on Sabrina. Unlike Tinsect, we have a type weakness in this gym, but um, similar to Tinsect, we're quite physically gifted. I miss the one shot against Mr. Mime using her healing turn to bulk up, and then I miss again against Venomoth getting confused. Beyond that, it's heavy hits, and we finish the battle at full health. We're heading back through Celadon next, so let's stop by and face Erica. <laughs> Hercules does not get access to Aerial Ace, so we instead have to rely on Return as it's now our best option against her. Oh, but we're also level 40 now. We one-shot her whole team with ease, claiming our fifth badge. It's then to the department store where I max Protein, then Carbos, then spend any extra cash on Iron for defense. It'll make setting up a little more consistent in the late game. I follow the same route as Tinsect, clearing the Safari Zone and facing Koga. <laughs> At level 41, we face our 6th gym leader. Hercules is at a lot more risk in this battle for a couple of reasons. Reason 1 is that we miss the range on return, opening us up to a sludge. I bulk up while he heals, then take down coughing. Poison is an issue for us, so I have a Pecha Berry equipped, but Minimize and Smokescreen will also be problematic as we don't have a move that ignores accuracy. Fortunately, we do have the power to be able to muscle our way through, with his Ace Wheezing eventually activating our berry, but we got through without issue. We collect our 6th badge and let's take a moment to see how our competitors are doing so far. Tinsect was able to pull ahead at Erica, but remember that she had access to Aerial Ace, whereas Hercules' 4th badge was actually Sabrina. We see Hercules regain the lead by over 8 minutes, losing a bit of time at the 6th, but still ahead by 7 minutes and 20 seconds. It's always a tough thing to choose in these solo runs. Grind in the first run, or don't. I suspect that we're gonna need it, but I don't know how much. Blaine's Gym is a fantastic place for both experience and speed EVs, but if we don't need to grind here, then why would we? The unfortunate part in the first playthroughs is that by choosing to skip these trainers, I can't go back and challenge them later after Blaine is defeated. In these initial playthroughs though, I like to push against the limits of a Pokémon's abilities, so let's jump straight into Blaine. <laughs> We're weak to fire moves and we'll also be facing two Intimidates in this battle. Not great for a physical attacking bug. I can use Rock Slide to delete both his Growlithe and Ponyta. When Rapidash hits the field, we miss Rock Slide as Rapidash springs into the air. Well, we might as well use the turn to set up. I bulk up while getting hit by a 4 times super effective bounce for a little under half. Rock Slide connects and we find ourselves facing Blaine's Ace Arcanine, intimidated back to minus one attack. We miss the second time, exposing ourselves to a Fire Blast for a reset. Things go a bit better when we actually hit Rapidash, but we miss the one shot, leaving him in deep red bar. He responds with Stomp of all things, pff, okay dude, so I bulk up once while he heals. Rock Slide finishes him off, bringing us back to Arcanine at minus one attack. Rock Slide connects, doing just over half, but we also get the flinch. I follow up with Rock Slide and we seal the deal, collecting our seventh badge. It's time to really start considering what our Pokémon leagues are going to look like. Hercules does have the option of avoiding a lot of status problems by going in with a burn boosting our attack. We can also set up with bulk up and best of all have excellent physical coverage with a speed stat to back it up. I always love having multiple options in front of me. I help Bill in the Sevi Islands and then challenge our final gym leader, Giovanni. I skipped the trainers in his gym because, like I said, we do have options. I don't want my speed reduced by Scary Face, so I go for Stab Super Effective Brick Breaks, taking out both of his Rhyhorns. Dugtrio is less threatening than the Nidos in the back, so I set up a single bulk up while Dugtrio responds with Slash for a whole 11 damage. I then start going for the sweep, missing the one shot against Nidoqueen and getting poisoned, bulking up once more, and there goes the battle. Hercules grabs his final gym badge in less than an hour. 
we have one final challenge before the Pokemon League, Rival 6. I open with a super effective Rock Slide, bringing him to Red Bar, while Pidgeot fires back a stab four times super effective Wing Attack, barely not taking us into the red. He doesn't have great healing items in this battle, so I go for another, taking him out. Alakazam then outspeeds, hitting a Psychic with more than enough power to take down our remaining 34 hit points. I tried again at level 48, but Charizard outsped and ended me. He's still rocking Flamethrower instead of Fire Blast like he will in the league, so there's not even a chance to miss that we can hope for. Speaking of that grinding, let's go clear some trainers out. I start in the Fighting Dojo in Saffron, as it's dense with XP and attack EVs. After clearing that, it's time to try again. I know that Charizard outspeeds me at 48, but with my XP where it is, I wonder what happens at level 49. I miss the one-shot against Pidgeot, but get the flinch and take it down. That's perfect. Alakazam disables Brick Break this time, but I know his tricks having switched to return and get the one-shot. We level to 49, and let's see what happens. I go for Rock Slide, we outspeed, and take down the big threat in one shot. Our Brick Break comes back just in time for Rhyhorn, and this battle is ours. After moving through Victory Road, I make sure to grab the Lumberry to the left side. It's likely to come in handy. Hercules enters the league doors at 1 hour and 46 seconds. Tinsect is gonna have a much rougher time with Blaine. Where Hercules was weak, we're four times weak, and where Hercules had super effective Rock Slide, we have Return as our best option. We do, though, have Sword Stance, so as I once again skip the trainers in Blaine's gym, let's see how this goes at level 48. <laughs> I set up one Sword Stance against his lead Growlithe, bringing us back to plus one after the Intimidate. He goes for Fire Blast, and that's a big old nope. I reset a few times, not making it much further, but let's try setting up against Ponyta. Even at minus one, Return does enough to one-shot Growlithe. I set up SD, and Ponyta gives us another firm nope. Tinsect wants all of the speed that she can get, so I clear the trainers in Blaine's gym trying again at level 50. Ponyta does, unless I'm mistaken, do less damage than Growlithe, so I hope I'm setting up against the correct one. Either way, Ponyta hands us another nope. Here, let me check real quick. Yep, Growlithe says nope too. After once again clearing the Fighting Dojo, it's on to Cycling Road. I'm targeting level 53 over the next damage rounding threshold. I've been asked in the comments recently about what these are. These older games didn't exactly have the computing power that we have access to today, and there are some quirks. Your level is included in the damage calculation, but the problem is that the game can't handle floating points, or decimals. It truncates anything after the decimal point, as if it never existed at all. According to the game, 6.1 and 6.9 9, nice, are the same value of 6. This results in disproportionate increases in damage as you level up. Your damage will increase at every level that ends in a 0, 3, 5, or 8. I'm targeting primarily the trainers that provide attack and speed EVs on my way down Cycling Road, finishing my grind against the Bird Keepers on the south end for even more speed EVs. Alright, let's try again, now at level 53. The plan is the same, to set up against Ponyta, so I take out Growlithe immediately with Return. I misclick, going for Aerial Ace, and just immediately reset. We have zero margin of error in this battle. This time I set up my Sword Stance correctly, and now survive a Fire Blast. I also managed to grab a Rostberry from our army of Meowth, so we're saved from that burn. I can then sweep through Ponyta and Rapidash, bringing out Arcanine, who intimidates us back to neutral attack. Return does an impressive amount of damage, but falls short and Arcanine takes us down. More training, and at level 55, we're back at Arcanine. This time, it's clear that we're going to win based on luck, as Arcanine misses his Fire Blast. This puts him in a healing loop for a few turns, but we eventually prevail. I am definitely going to have to come up with a better solution for this battle in the next run, but for now, let's count our blessings and move on with seven badges in hand. I help Bill in the Sevi Islands, following the same route that Hercules did. This includes skipping the trainers in Giovanni's gym. It's around the mid-40s that the medium fast growth rate's fast aspect really starts to kick in. We're now above that threshold, and I want to try and minimize our grinding, so let's jump ahead to our final gym battle. <laughs> Thank you. 
Metal Claw has been a great tool for us to use since we learned it. It deals super effective damage against rock Pokemon, but it does have that pesky 95% accuracy. Anyone who plays these games knows that sometimes 95% is 10%, as we miss two in a row getting taken to minus four speed. Well, so much for outspeeding, as I set up one SD against Dugtrio before going on the offensive. Tinsect has a fantastic defensive stat, so we soak up all of the earthquakes that he throws at us, securing our final badge. It's time to take out Rival 6 and then face the leagues. I set up an SD against Pidgeot while he responds with a wing attack for a bit of damage. Return takes him out. At this level, we outspeed Charizard and then can carve through his remaining team members with ease. You gotta love running Glass Cannon Pokemon. Tinsect enters the league doors at 1 hour, 18 minutes, and 10 seconds. Before starting the round one league, let's see where our competitors stand. Tinsect had a nasty time against Blaine, and so she lost a lot of time. Hercules, very similarly to Pinsir, has played incredibly intuitively with powerful physical attacks, good speed, and great coverage. Tinsect, very similarly to Scyther, has had the least coverage of the two, but with a better setup move and faster growth rate, we might just have the advantage coming into these leagues. Tinsect just hit level 60 after all, while Hercules is only about to level up to 50. Without any further ado, let's jump into the Pokemon League. Lorelei kicks us off. We're completely neutral against each other, so I set up a single SD and go on the offense. We miss the one shot against Cloyster because of its outstanding defense. So we do the same thing we always do. Try to take over the world, Pinky. I mean, set up an extra SD while she heals, yeah. Now at plus four, the fight is laughably easy. Our first league member falls with haste. The ability to set up continues paying dividends against Bruno. I set up a single SD as Onyx hits Earthquake for around an eighth. After I misclick on return, I use Metal Claw to deal with both Onyx Assises and Aerial Ace to handle his remaining team. Our moveset hasn't changed at all since learning Sword Stand, still carrying Metal Claw, Aerial Ace, and Return to round it out. Bruno falls, but there are much greater challenges ahead. Against Agatha, we're about to witness the same shenanigans once again. Her lead Gengar loves setting up Double Team and Hypnosis, so I do have a Chesto Berry equipped. Gengar keeps using Double Team, so I use two SDs setting up to plus four. Aerial Ace can't miss, so we take her down, then it's a series of outspeeds and one-shots. Her Ace Gengar does outspeed us, though, so it's good to know that we're right in that speed pocket. The fact that we're the Steel type again helps us a lot. Tinsec cleans up another easy league victory. Dragon Master Lance is next, where I've discovered in the past that you can set up reasonably well against his lead Gyarados. We set up to plus four at the cost of 80 HP before taking him down. Aerodactyl, of course, outspeeds and hits Ancient Power, getting the Omni Boost. It isn't enough to save him, though, as Metal Claw takes him out. Return, 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 handles his Ace Dragonite and two Dragonairs in the back. This was a really easy league, but we have one problem at the champion. That Charizard. Against the champion, I foresee one of two results. We outspeed Charizard and win, or we don't. Pidgeot leads with Feather Dance, cancelling my setup, but I get a second round in while he hits Aerial Ace. Return takes him down, and it's Charizard time. At level 63, he outspeeds and we fall. At level 65, he outspeeds and we fall. At level 68, he outspeeds and we fall. At level 70, we outspeed and he falls. Oh yeah! If you're wondering, I was incrementing our level higher in between resets with Rare Candies. With Charizard out of the way, it's a very one-sided battle. Every time we miss a one-shot, I set up even more Swords Dance and continue my assault. We take down Executor in the back, and with him, the Round 1 League. Glass Cannon indeed. I feel like the only gate that was holding us back there was our speed. Perhaps next run, a nature that increases speed instead of attack is in order. Tinsect clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 25 minutes, and 2 seconds at level 71 with 21 resets. This took 4 hours and 45 minutes of game time. Now, let's go back to the start and see how Hercules handles the first league.
We're 11 levels lower than Tinsect was coming into the league, but Hercules is still a force to be reckoned with. Against Lorelei, we have a type advantage against most of her team, as Ice is weak to fighting. I set up a single bulk up and then start rolling through Lorelei's team with a swift succession of brutal brick breaks, switching to return for Slowbro. At only level 50, Hercules crushes this battle. Bruno shouldn't be too difficult for us either. Brick Break can't one-shot Onyx as he hits Rock Tomb, lowering our speed. Fine then, I bulk up while he heals and then Brick Break can handle him. Hitmonchan loves using counter if you've knocked out that Onyx with a physical move, so I get one more cheeky bulk up in. Sky Uppercut hurts, but we hurt a lot more taking him down. That's the case for the rest of the battle. Even five levels lower than the Mighty Machamp, we show him up easily because we have a slight pump and better lighting. This battle against Agatha gets really messy really fast, and honestly, it's chaotic enough that I honestly still can't tell if I'm playing poorly or if it's just bad overall. I doubt I can one-shot, so I set up bulk up while she starts using double teams. Rockslide misses the KO, so I go for another bulk up and then we get confused. The confusion gets Hercules all kinds of turned around, hitting herself twice before missing. We finally take her down, but at only 58 health for the rest of the battle. I start making my way through her team, but it's when her ace Gengar hits the field that we're in trouble. She outspeeds and picks apart our remaining health. This time I go for two bulk ups right off the hop. We miss, but once we connect we're moving on from her lead Gengar at nearly full health, much better than last time. We carve through her team all the way to her ace Gengar again, where she tries putting us to sleep. But I have a Chesto Berry equipped, ha 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 ha, waking up and hitting a big rock slide. She misses her second hypnosis and it's just a matter of cleaning up the battle from there. Agatha presented a bit of a speed bump that's for sure, but we're still moving quite quickly through this league. Against Lance, I'm gonna follow the same plan as Tinsect, setting up as much as I'm comfortable with against Gyarados before going on the offense. I set up three bulk ups at only plus two attack because of the intimidation. Let's go for it. Aerodactyl then outspeeds and stab super effective wing attack takes us down. After a few resets and dipping into Hercules' rare candy stash a little as well, I'm trying at level 55 over two damage rounding thresholds. I now set up two bulk ups before missing the KO against Gyarados. I also have a Citrus Berry for that extra 30 HP. He heals while I set up once more to plus two attack and plus three defense before taking him down. At plus three, we now have the toughness to tank his wing attack with it leaving us at 14 HP, 8% of our max. But thanks to our setup and speed, once Aerodactyl falls, we can clean up the rest of the Dragon Master's team. Booyah, it's champion time. My first battle goes very badly. Pidgeot hits a Feather Dance, followed by a Sand Attack. I actually just hit the reset button early here. Those are not good odds to go into a battle with, and I'd rather just save the time. Alright, second attempt, I lead with Bulk Up while he goes for the damage this time. Plus one defense should help mitigate that damage, unless that damage is a critical, and we fall again immediately. Here we go again. I Bulk Up this time, and he goes for Sand Attack. Those are odds I guess I can handle. At plus one, Rock Slide can get the one shot. At level 53, we learned Mega Horn, an incredibly powerful bug type move, but it only has 85% accuracy. I had to learn it, but I don't know if I'm gonna keep it. It deletes Alakazam, but not before he outspeeds, hitting a massive Psychic for around 80% of our max. Charizard outspeeds as well, and that's way more than we can handle. After seven more resets and incrementing my level with rare candies up again, we're attempting the battle at level 63. Rockslide one-shots his lead Pidgeot, though with a crit. It was a very close range at level 60, and this is my first attempt at level 63. A great perk of this level is that we finally outspeed Alakazam, taking him out before he can touch us. At 159 speed, if we outspeed Alakazam, we definitely outspeed Charizard, who's only 150. Rockslide gets the Oko. Then, witness the power of Hercules as we can smash through his remaining team members with our incredible physical prowess, getting an extra bulk up in against Rhydon. Gotta look good for that Hall of Fame picture in a second. It seems that it was the case with both Pokémon that they struggled with speed, but once over that threshold, the battle was ours. 
Hercules clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 57 seconds at level 64 with 24 resets. This took 4 hours of game time. Before I defeat the Rockets one more time clearing the Sevi Island plotline and unlocking the Round 2 League, I want to take a quick detour to Seven Island. Here I can grab Sword Stance from the Move Tutor on the bridge. At long last, setting up is now super easy for Hercules as well. Now take a moment to enjoy some top tier movement. I've gotten a lot better in recent months, but I still have my fail moments. This is just a whole chain of them. I also made sure to grab the leftovers from beneath the Snorlax on Route 12 using the Item Finder. We're now ready ready for the Round 2 League. Along with some team and moveset changes, all of their teams have been powered up by around 12 levels. Let's jump in. Against Lorelei, we are only one level higher than her ace Lapras. Does this hold back Hercules? Not one bit. We miss the one shot against Lapras, taking the opportunity to set up our first sword stance. Glorious. This fight was ours, but now at plus two, it would take some serious misplay on my part to lose. I smash through her remaining team, still sporting the moveset of Brick Break, Rock Slide, Mega Horn, and Sword Stance. <laughs> These early league fights are such a cakewalk for both of these Pokémon. Sword Stance is an incredibly powerful option to have on your side. I set up one while Steelix misses Iron Tail and it's a sweep from there. Brick Break picks him apart. I'm just now realizing that I haven't been able to find much use of Guts in this run, unfortunately. In my testing, I'll have to see if there's a way through these leagues at a lower level, though there's always that issue of speed. It's against Agatha that we find ourselves in trouble once again. I do that thing that I'm sure we all do sometimes and remember off the top of my head some type interaction that I never use based on some shaky anecdotal evidence from when I was a kid. Apparently not only is Gengar not weak to bug moves, but resists them. This gets me put to sleep and it's a death spiral from there. Let's try again, but this time I get confused after setting up a Sword Stance. Increasing my attack stat with Sword Stance means that when I hit my opponents, I'm hitting harder. But that also applies to myself. Mix in that super effective Psychic and we're not looking like we're in very good shape. Despite all of his strength, Hercules is a little bit of a slow learner, discovering that hitting himself a second time hurts equally as much as the first time knocking himself out. Alright, enough messing about, let's do this right. I set up SD while Gengar goes for Psychic this time for over half, but our leftovers bounces back just over half. Rockslide gets the KO. We once again start blitzing through her team leveling up to 69, nice, after defeating Crobat. We're halted at her ace Gengar, leaving it in red bar while firing back a Psychic, taking us into red bar. Thank goodness for leftovers as we continue to recover, setting up another SD while she heals and getting the knockout. Arbok in the back is an easy cleanup. I knew I could get through that if Hercules would just stop hitting himself. Ah, such fond memories with my little sister. Stop hitting yourself! Stop hitting yourself! <laughs> Dragon Doctoral Lance's lead Gyarados loves leading with Thunder Wave to wreck your consistency. It activates our Guts ability, increasing our attack along with the Sword Stance that we just set up, but we have to deal with the lower speed and quarter chance to not move. I take down Gyarados after one such turn. Aerodactyl is out, outspeeding, and oh my, what the? Stab four times super effective Aerial Ace hits Hercules for 209 damage, a massive 96% of our max health. We then take him down, but paralyzed, and this beat up? No way, man. His lesser Dragonite hits Dragon Claw, taking us out. After a couple of resets, I'm still trying, this time without my leftovers, but heck, as long as we outspeed and one-shot, who needs recovery, right? I set up SD while Gyarados uses Thunder Wave, triggering our held Cherry Berry. Rock Slide takes him out. Aerodactyl beats us up real bad again, hitting for 214 damage this time, just shy of 99% of our max. We take him out, so let's cross our fingers here. Once we get to Kingdra, it's disappointment that awaits us, as we only do around 3 quarters to him, and he finishes us off with Surf. Several more resets, and after burning through my last rare candy, we're starting the battle at level 70 these days. It's curtains once again though, I'm afraid to say, because that Aerodactyl is just too much. He takes us out, doing 100% of our max HP this time, and it's time for a change in strategy. 
Fly myself down to Fuchsia, this is my last resort. Substitution, no status, substrats, best strats, you can't surpass us. I'll skip right ahead to Lance, as with the addition of Substitute to our team, Agatha was laughably easy. I have my leftovers equipped again, setting up my decoy turn one against Lance. I then set up twice with SD and go for the sweep. The main reason I wanted Substitute was to block this one wing attack, but the extra setup was sure nice. Aerodactyl even throws in a crit this time, but no damage comes to Hercules himself as our decoy breaks and Aerodactyl falls. It's then A, B, C. Easy as one, two, three, as we one-shot his remaining three mighty dragons. That leaves us with one final challenge, the round two champion. He leads with Heracross, who is going to be 100% focused on trying to lower our speed with Rock Tomb. My response is to hide behind my decoy, setting up sword stances. Once we're at plus four and behind a decoy, it's time to go for it, taking down our evil twin. It's incredible, because now we just get to rock through his team. Hercules even outspeeds Charizard, deleting him with a plus four, four times super effective rock slide. Lance's Aerodactyl was the true final boss of this league. As Gyarados's health bar falls to zero, we can let out a sigh of relief. We have defeated the round two champion. I think I'm gonna have to come up with something clever for that Aerodactyl. Our damage output was not the problem there, it was another speed issue. Hmm, things to contemplate for the next run. Hercules clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 39 minutes and 22 seconds at level 73 with 40 resets. This took 5 hours and 19 minutes of game time. Alright everyone, let's go check out Tinsect's round 2 Pokemon League. Tinsect is sticking with her old tricks. We're still rocking the exact same moveset of Metal Claw, Aerial Ace, Return and Swords Dance. I set up once and get to work. Our medium fast growth rate has been paying dividends as we're starting this league at level 74, higher than Hercules just finished with. I get a second turn of setup in using a heel turn, and yeah, we're quickly moving on to Brew No No No. Oh, Steelix, right, that could be a problem. Every move that we currently have is resisted by this defensive wall. I guess my best way is to set up to plus six, which I do successfully, but by the time we take out Steelix, our speed is absolutely trashed at minus four, and we only have 86 HP after leftovers. We managed to survive Hitmonlee, but Hitmonchan takes us down with a Sky Uppercut. I took a moment after the reset to finally teach over Metal Claw with Steel Wing. Instead of a chance to boost our attack, it gives a chance to boost our defense. It's also more powerful, but slightly less accurate at 90%. It's now our highest power move, including Stab. I feel like the thing that really turned the tide here, though, is that Steelix only hit two Rock Tombs, so we outspeed more of his Pokémon, therefore taking less damage. Steel Wing carves through his team. I'm actually loving being able to use this move for a change. I never use Steel Wing. Our steel typing makes Agatha significantly easier. She can still troll us with Hypnosis and Confuse Ray, that's for sure, but with the recovery of leftovers, we have a lot of staying power. I get my one turn of setup in against her lead Gengar, and once we're done messing about napping, Tinsect trounces her team. Did anyone else just see that? I swear, I just saw a Charizard shaped shadow shoot by. Maybe I'm just imagining things. The way that this Gyarados encounter goes hopefully effectively demonstrates that we're in a bit of trouble now. Return is doing sad damage without any setup, so I start trying to. That paralysis is nasty though, as we finally take down Gyarados, we're only at 25 HP, which Dragonite then cleans up. Add a few more resets and here we are again after a few rare candies. Tinsect has a few remaining. Now at level 80, I set up once with SD while my Held Cherry Berry cures our paralysis. Return takes down Gyarados on the next turn. From there, it's pretty much easy street, as Scizor has a fair amount of bulk to take a few hits throughout the battle. The biggest pain here was getting rid of Gyarados, and level 80 finally allowed us to get the one-shot. If we missed the one-shot, he would paralyze us, and the fight was basically over. We're ready to move on to the round two Charizard. I, I mean champion. We know that speed is a big issue against this Charizard. 
What's the first thing that happens against Heracross? Well, he hits a Rock Tomb, reducing our speed, of course. Even he now outspeeds us, hitting a chunky Critical Earthquake as we take him down. Charizard is out, and yeah, there's no way we're out of there. It is a fact that I cannot handle having my speed reduced, so this time I go for four times super effective Aerial Ace, taking out Heracross early. Much to my pleasure, it turns out that we do in fact outspeed Charizard, but only do around half damage to him as Fire Blast deletes Tinsect. Alright, the whole reason I caught the army of Meowths early was for this. I held off as long as I could, but early in the game they found us TM10 Hidden Power. As I discussed earlier, I chose HP Rock, so after clearing away Heracross again, we find ourselves facing Charizard. We outspeed, and four times super effective HP Rock takes down Charizard in one. Steelwing misses, and then misses the range against Tyranitar, taking the opportunity to set up another SD. Another nice thing about being the Steel type is that his Sandstorm doesn't affect us, so we continue recovering with leftovers. He falls, then Gyarados enters the battle, intimidating us, then getting blown away by another HP Rock. Steelwing misses another knockout against Alakazam, so I once again set up another SD while he heals. He even hits us with a critical Psychic. Get out of here! Using Aerial Ace, we miss the range again against Executor, so I will set up one more SD and take him down. Missing ranges was a common theme in both of these runs. It's going to be fascinating to dial in my grinding throughout both of these playthroughs to see just how much time we can shave off. Tinsect clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 45 minutes, and 12 seconds at level 81 with 27 resets. This took 5 hours and 49 minutes of game time. Hold on tight everyone, we're going to be moving fast through these second playthroughs. No shiny gym leader intros, which by the way I hope you enjoyed, and anything that we'll be doing that is very similar to the first playthrough I'll simply gloss over. Both Pokemon will now be named I as one character name, save time over a run because the game has to type less text. Every little bit counts. We'll also be running with a jolly nature this time, increasing speed and still decreasing special attack. I'm skipping everything once again in the early game, making a beeline to Brock. Despite not having as much attack this run, reversal and our resistance is going to carry us through just like last time. We defeat Brock and set our sights on Cerulean City. On the way through Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil. Now it's time for the first routing change. We're going right for the strategy that we discovered last run with reversal. This time, on our way past this grass, we're going to massage our HP into the range that we want. We find an Ekans right away, but it's level 8, which is a worse level than the level 6 variant. It now knows Poison Sting, which doesn't hurt us, but it wastes time as wild Pokemon choose their abilities randomly, as far as I can tell anyway. Things are going perfectly until Ekans gets a crit with Rap right at the end. This puts us at 3 HP, so we're in the second highest range for damage, but at the lowest possible health within that range. I chuck down a quick save and let's go try this out. We get our answer really quickly in this battle because Pidgeotto uses a quick attack. 3 HP is just too low of a health to be at, so I reset. Back at the grass, I've made a tough decision. It wasn't part of the initial plan, but I'm going to use a rare candy to elevate us to level 16. If you saw Scizor's XP bar, we were right in a pocket at level 15 where the Charmeleon knockout would have leveled us up, then no longer needing reversal. But that crit from Ekans really messed things up. We would have been at 4 HP otherwise. We gained 2 HP from the level up, so now I need to find a Rattata. Ekans Wrap will deal a minimum of 4 damage, Spiro knows Peck, but Rattata only knows normal moves which I can use to chip down by a hit point or two. At level 16, we learned False Swipe, which will always leave the opponent at 1 HP. It's fantastic for catching Meowths in a moment, by the way. This Rattata used Tail Whip, and so when he finally attacks us, he does 3 damage. Nope, let's try again. I decided not to increment the reset counter because I'm not really sure what that counts as. It feels like when I reset the game during Lieutenant Surge's trash can puzzle. This isn't really a feint or a loss, this is just using the save mechanic to build in a little bit of reliability and save time. Uh, I don't know, either way, this time Rattata uses Quick Attack for 2 damage, putting us at 4 HP right in our butter zone. 6 HP, by the way, is 11% in the 100 base power range. At 4 HP now, we're in the 150 base power range. Now in that butter zone, Reversal cuts through his Pidgeotto and Charmander, with Abra and Rattata being an easy cleanup in the back, including the couple of HP that we healed from leveling up. 
The rival is going to be the most challenging part of Scizor's run, that's for sure, with many routing choices made solely around him. I defeat Misty, and then head south to Vermilion. On the way down, I want to make sure to bring my HP back down to a lower range for reversal heading towards the rival 3 fight. I choose to do this against Camper Jeff's Raticate, as his Spiro again knows Peck. I have to be aware of Hyperfang, so I decide to defeat him at 12 HP, 17% in the 100 base power range. Our level is proportionally higher to the rival's team relative to our last battle, so we should be fine in that lower range. Is it ever, as we one-shot his entire team. Okay, Scizor is about to steamroll the next section of the game, so get ready for some quick progress. I defeat Lieutenant Surge, and poof! Suddenly we're at Erika, following the exact same route as last run. The fun part about this is that I now get to show off the nature's mechanic a little bit. Since we followed the exact same route to this point, we are more or less the exact same scissor in this battle with the exception that we now have the jolly nature instead of adamant. In our first playthrough, we one-shot her entire team with our attack boosted by 10%, but in this run, with our speed boosted and said, we are not one-shotting any of her team members. It doesn't matter too much, as we still mop the floor with her, but I think this was a really cool thing to show. Okay, back onto turbo mode. Correct move choices allows us an easy victory over Rival 4, and poof! We're done our item collection in Sylph and ready to face Rival 5. Everything has been the same as last run, except this time I've used 5 rare candies bringing Scizor up to level 45. This, including our nature, should be more than enough for Rival 5. I hope. What am I even doing in this battle? I should be setting up against Pidgeot because we will not survive Charizard. Ah, <sighs> that was silly. At minus 2, return obviously does sad damage as Charizard knocks us out. I reset once more due to a missed return against Charizard, but here in this battle, Pidgeot goes for double wing attack, hitting for a bit of damage but leaving our accuracy intact. Oh yeah, at plus 4 we're ready to rock. Well, technically not yet, because I haven't found TM10 yet, but Return bashes through his whole team without issue. We are rolling through these battles that really held us up in the last run. I defeat Sabrina, and then it's into the department store in Celadon to max our vitamins. I focus on Carbos first, then Protein, then any vitamins that I can't or don't want to use I'm selling and reinvesting into Zinc for special defense. Blaine is looming. So I can't think of a better time to get some grinding done. I clear the right path on Cycling Road for attack and speed EVs, the Bird Keepers at the south end for speed, and finish my grinding with the Fighting Dojo for more attack. It's then back to Fuchsia where I defeat Koga. Then it's time to defeat even more trainers in Blaine's gym for more experience, more speed EVs, and more importantly, more chances to find TM10. I was hoping to have had it by now, but the RNG can be fickle at times. I wind up just shy of my target, so I jump back into Pokemon Mansion to polish off my experience and level up to 55. Alright, back at Blaine, where after reaching level 55, I used 5 rare candies, elevating us to level 60. I still haven't found TM10, so I have to rely on my backup strategy. The random chance of finding hidden power is why relying on it can be such a problem. I go for my setup against Ponyta as before, and wow, these extra levels and special defense vitamins made a big difference in our survivability. When Arcanine comes out though, we're in trouble. We get a low range getting taken out by Fire Blast. In my next attempt though, Ponyta ends up missing a Fire Blast, so I jump at the opportunity to sneak in a second sword stance. Please don't crit, and we're good. There's no way Arcanine survives now. I can sweep through the rest of his team, netting us our 7th badge. Just like last run, I'll help Bill and complete the first part of the Sevi Island plotline. Unlike last run, I'll also be clearing the trainers in Giovanni's gym. I do still need a bit of experience and would really like to find my salvation soon. It's called TM10. Otherwise, Charizard is going to be a big, big problem in the not-too-distant future. I defeat Giovanni, finishing the gym challenge, and let's face this pre-league Charizard. Because at this point we're like 20 levels over leveled, it's no surprise that once I get my sword stance up, Pidgeot cancelled the first one with Feather Dance, we outspeed and clear out his team as well. I'm starting to get nervous not having found TM10 yet. Luckily, I do have my backup plan for the round 1 league, so we don't have to stop all progress to go and find it. Scizor enters the league doors at 1 hour, 5 minutes and 30 seconds, 12 minutes and 46 seconds ahead of last run. Before we start the leagues, let's go check out the changes we made to Heracross. This run actually has a bit of a slower start than I'd anticipated. Apparently at level 10 using Bide against Brock, we got really lucky last time. 
Or maybe somehow the adamant nature made our bide do more damage because of some weird quirk or interaction that I'm unaware of. Maybe we were just incredibly lucky. I have no idea. Either way, in my testing at level 10 after changing to the jolly nature, we lost 9 out of 10 times against him. As such, I've cleared every trainer in the game up to this point, including Rival 1.5, and I'm now finishing off our grind to level 11 in the wild grass just south of Pewter. I tried sticking with using a horn attack or two at the start of battle before Geodude sets up too many defense curls, but honestly, his move selection seems so random to me that I figured just going for bide over and over was the way. We get really unlucky here, with Geodude outplaying us, going primarily for defense curls while we absorb energy, but then tackle after we've unleashed it. It results in an early reset. Going into Onyx at 12 health is impossible to win anyway, as Onyx has 33 hit points. I reset once more and then the stars align. We get fortunate enough with Geodude's turn order that we take him down still with 27 HP for Onyx. That feels like a good number. Things get real close by the end, but we're triumphant. I'd considered using struggle strats here, but Heracross has a lot of PP to deplete, including a lot of tackle, which would essentially turn my PP depletion into grinding. I feel like this is the faster option. We finish the battle at 5 HP successfully, and we have a run. On the way through Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil again. Oh yeah, we are all Dome today. Praise the Dark Lord. Alright, let's get out of here before the Helix fans find out. At the end of Mount Moon, I was poisoned in the last battle and decided to keep it for the Rival 2 battle. It cost me the last of my potions, but I feel like a guaranteed win is better given I don't know the ranges as Jolly instead of Adamant here. I'm not that thorough in my routing, though I'm working on resources to better route these things. Anyways, as you can see with Rock Tomb and Guts boosting our attack from the poison status, Rival 2 gets obliterated. Well, that was fun. I'm gonna heal this poison now. I then defeat Misty, and head straight to Rival 3 on the SSN. Heracross had a much easier time with the Rival compared to Scizor throughout the game, especially after Rock Tunnel once we have access to Rock Slide. The most threat that we were under during this battle was when our Rock Tomb missed the one-shot against Charmeleon, putting him in Blaze range. But even Blaze boosted, he'd still be doing less to us than poor Scizor. He just growled anyway, so we win and let's chew through some game. I defeat Lieutenant Surge, and we find ourselves quickly in the mid-game following the same route as last time. This time, though, I come to Erica's gym immediately after clearing the rocket hideout. I want to avoid the backtracking later, and though we may not be able to get one-shots here, I'm confident that we're still going to win. I still have my Cherry Berry equipped from Surge, and it gets consumed by Victory Bell's Stun Spore as Return is doing around half. We miss the two-shot getting paralyzed, but that activates Guts. We're bulky enough to pretty much stomp through her team from there, but my goodness, that paralysis can be nasty. I then defeat Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower, and suddenly we find ourselves prepping for Rival 5, having followed the same route as last game again to this point. I've used four rare candies, bringing Heracross to level 40 for this battle. Rock Slide just barely misses the one-shot against Pidgeot while he fires back a Feather Dance, lowering our attack by two stages. Y you know, yep, I'm not even risking that one. Reset. I reset a second time in the same way, and then in this battle, Rock Slide gets the range. Thank you, I knew that was possible. Leaning on lessons learned in the last run, I have another Cherry Berry equipped for when Execute uses Stun Spore, and we win! It's time for some heavy progression as we aim towards the endgame. Next on the block is Sabrina, followed by Koga for our sixth badge. On Cinnabar, I will also be defeating every trainer in Blaine's gym. It should be noted that Heracross has been doing some grinding as well, in the exact same way that Scizor's second playthrough did. Heracross faces down Blaine, where I should have used this Fire Blast miss against Ponyta to bulk up a second time. But I was a little hasty after playing Scizor with Sword Stance and too used to that, so at minus one we miss the one shot and get taken out. Small skip ahead, after several more resets I realize why Blaine is going so poorly. Not because I'm used to Sword Stance, but because I'm two levels lower than I intended. I actually didn't do the grinding along Cycling Road. Dope! But hey, let's check out the battle when I actually follow the plan. This cost us a little bit of time, but hopefully not too much. It's then the same as before, helping Bill and going straight to Giovanni afterwards, no extra training. I then have a wicked lucky battle against Rival 6 and we're off to the league. Heracross enters the league doors at 1 hour, 4 minutes and 26 seconds. Actually 3 minutes and 40 seconds slower than last run, but we've done a lot more grinding. As Heracross preps for the league, let's check out where we stand. This race is 
close. There have been some back and forth throughout the game, with Scizor leading most of the way this time. They actually defeated Giovanni one second apart, with Heracross entering the league doors one minute ahead of Scizor because it needed a little bit of extra grinding in Victory Road. With that, let's jump into the leagues. Lately, in my second playthroughs, if these Round 1 League battles are overly easy or very similar to the same battles in the Round 2 League, I've begun skipping them. It's against Agatha where things start getting a little interesting. By interesting, of course, I mean frustrating. My physical attackers in these runs rely a lot on Rock Slide when they can learn it. It covers a lot in these leagues very well, but with the drawback of only having 90% accuracy. I get behind my decoy and set up while Agatha spams double team like it's going out of style. The result? Seven rock slide misses with the one that connected missing the range. Let's just reset. It happens again? Gosh, Agatha, you can be annoying sometimes. But then we see a battle where we connect with that Gengar and it's much smoother. I elected to grab Substitute before the Round 1 League this time, as since I'm grabbing it for the Round 2 League anyway, I might as well avoid the backtracking. It doesn't lend much help in this league aside from Agatha and the Champion, but hey, time saved is time saved. The last trainer between those two is Dragon Master Lance. Rock Slide is a great answer to him as well, so we're going to just cruise on by, although I did reset once due to a crit wing attack from Aerodactyl. I complete my preparations, make sure my PP is restored, and let's face down the round one champion. Against the champion, Substitute is going to help us exactly once. Turn 1, I set up my decoy, blocking a Feather Dance. I can then set up one bulk up while Pidgeot breaks my decoy. We're ready to go, Rock Slide takes him out. That plus one was actually for Pidgeot and the later opponents. It's the speed we needed against both Alakazam and Charizard, with our jolly nature letting us outspeed and take them both out. I put a decoy back up against Executor, dodging a Sleep Powder, and set up more. Our decoy breaks again and we do get put to sleep, but Executor really isn't that threatening. I eventually finish him off. With all of that setup though, it's no surprise that I blast through his Rhydon and Gyarados in the back. That was a very smooth league, all things considered. I really wanted to push the threshold a bit with Heracross, and we are at a lower level than last time. Heracross clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 11 minutes and 18 seconds at level 62 with 10 resets. This took 4 hours and 18 minutes of game time. Before going any further with Heracross, let's see how Scizor handles round 1. This is going to be another instance where I simply supercut my way through the early league. We're overleveled, again aiming to be over a specific speed threshold by the end of the game. As such, in this section, our level in combination with Sword Stance makes us almost unstoppable. Even the super trolly Agatha can't do much against Scizor because of our steel typing. I always laugh when her line comes up, I'll show you how a real trainer battles. Spamming double team Agatha, is that how a real trainer does it? After a very quick Quick and efficient league, we're ready once again to face the champion. We start by trading dances, swords for feathers. Hmm, the pen is mightier than the sword, but what about the quill? We get a second SD in while taking a sand attack. I don't like it, but it's the reality of not having hidden power still. Return takes out Bird Brains. Charizard is the primary and close to only threat on this team. We outspeed, hit, and our plus two return takes him down. With him out of the way, it's a no-brainer that we win as Scizor dismantles his team one by one. I grab an extra turn of setup against the Gyarados after missing the one shot, but that's the battle. Once you find your way around those fire types, it's astounding how powerful Scizor is. Another bug is winning me over. Scizor clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 9 minutes and 47 seconds at level 70 with 4 resets. This took 4 hours and 21 minutes of game time. I have one shorter run between leagues with Scizor. As much as I hate to admit it, we're going for Substitute with Scizor as well. I had someone pop into the premiere chat the other day saying, Hey, it's the Substitute guy! Is that what I've become? Well, I guess I'll wear it with pride because we know that Substrat's best strats. There is a specific reason for grabbing it in this run and it's probably not what you think. Scizor's round 2 league was interesting to solve.
Well, most of the League was interesting anyway, Lorelei not so much. I found TM10 Hidden Power while unlocking the Round 2 League in the Sevi Islands, thank goodness, so I have taught it over return. We're sporting a moveset of Steel Wing, HP Rock, Substitute, and Swords Dance. Definitely unique among my runs while still being similar. A single sword stance and super effective HP rock destroy Lorelei's team. I switch to Steel Wing for Piloswine and then clean up Jinx. Lorelei in both rounds was a cakewalk, but after a really easy round one Bruno, round two Bruno really surprised me. What I'm doing here is setting up my decoy anytime it breaks, hoping that Steelix goes for Rock Tomb often. I set up to plus 6, keeping my speed intact before going on the offense. We can only hit the Steelixes for resisted damage, so it takes two Steel Wings to bring them down. The rest fall in one, so what gives? This seems pretty easy. Well, it certainly does with your speed intact. Let's examine a bit of footage from my testing that prompted me to choose the substrats. While we're setting up in the background, I'll show nine battles from when I was testing. These are all using an almost identical scissor to the one we're currently using, although without substitute. I optimized this whole run for the round two champion's Charizard and was fine without substitute in every fight, except now Bruno wasn't possible. As all of the battles that are playing individually wrap up, you can see that they're all ending with the same result. If I am going to be known as the substitute guy, let it be known that I do do my due diligence <laughs> do -do, and seek strategies that don't always rely on the decoys. But with my most important metric being completion time, there is no denying that substrats best strats. With that said, I've set up and let's sweep Bruno. Wham, bam, thank you ma'am, this battle is completely different with your speed intact. <laughs> Well, we've got the decoys, we might as well use them against Agatha too. It removes almost all inconsistency from this battle, setting up a decoy and two swords dances before sweeping her team. Scizor was never in any serious danger against Agatha anyway, our steel typing alone is almost a win condition. Having needed substitute for Bruno, it also changes my strategies in the next two battles. <laughs> Originally, the plan was to use the strategy that we used in the first playthrough. Set up one SD while Gyarados triggers the berry, then use HP Rock to carve through. Instead, I set up a decoy which also blocks Thunder Wave. I can then set up with Impunity and follow the same strategy that I discussed. The biggest difference that Substitute makes is that it removes essentially all inconsistency again from this battle. We take down the Doctoral and we face down the Round 2 Champion. Against the champion, our strategy is altered too. I only needed level 75 to outspeed Charizard with this Scizor, but with Substitute, we no longer have Aerial Lace to deal with Heracross quickly. As such, I need to get behind my decoy and use it to guard my speed as we set up. We were not capable of one-shotting him without Aerial Lace, and losing even a single stage of speed means game over. I take him down with my speed intact. We then outspeed and one-shot Charizard with a plus four, four times super effective HP rock. That right there is pretty much curtains. We have an answer for the rest of his team. Stab super effective Steel Wing brings down Tyranitar. We continue outspeeding, taking down Gyarados with HP Rock. Another takes down Alakazam. We're at our champion's last Pokemon Executor. Switching to Steel Wing as HP Rock would not have gotten the job done. Scizor has done it. What an improvement over last run. It's a shame that I didn't find TM10 until so late in the game and I had to revert to those backup straps. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. Scizor clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 25 minutes, and 1 second at level 77 with 4 resets. This took 5 hours and 19 minutes of game time. The bar is set. Let's see if Heracross can do better. <laughs> With access to Sword Stance instead of Bulk Up now, Heracross's League presence becomes much more threatening. Poor Lorelei is getting absolutely stomped on in this video as I start stomping through her team with Brick Break, not even giving her first few Pokémon a chance. Lapras survives, prompting a Sword Stance, and then it's complete and utter destruction of her team. Heracross is here to do work. <laughs> Hey 
Heracross needed substitute for later in the league anyway, so we have it for Bruno as well. Just like Scizor, I use it to guard my speed while setting up. Unlike Scizor, we have Brick Break, and once we're at plus four, we one-shot Bruno's entire team. It is unbelievable what a solo Pokémon with a setup move can accomplish, especially one that is this strong to start. Agatha is definitely more threatening to Heracross than she was to Scizor, even with Substitute. Since we outspeed, though, we remain mostly in control, setting up a new decoy every time she breaks it with Psychic. Our reliable success in this battle relies heavily on leftovers and decoys. We take down her lead at plus two attack and around half health behind a decoy. Crobat takes out our decoy as Rock Slide takes it and Mischief is out, but then we miss the one shot against Gengar. We're exposed to a Psychic, which hits for massive damage, taking us down to 44 hit points. I use her healing turn to set up and take her down on the next, missing a bunch of times against Arbok, but eventually taking the Cobra down as well. Against Dragon Doctoral Lance, we have a similar fight to Scizors, but better. We hide behind a decoy and set up to plus three using two SDs. Heracross has Rock Slide, so we can hit Lance's entire team for super effective damage, excluding Kingdra. Dragon Master indeed. You may have noticed at the start of this fight, but Scizor's time to beat was 1 hour 25 and 1 second, which we have surpassed. We aren't done yet though, there's still work to be done against the round two champion. I set up a decoy against our evil twin, and he cannot counter that level of awesome. I set up to plus four with Sword Stance, so from behind our decoy, let's start breaking this team. Rock Slide takes out Heracross. The champions, not mine. Tyranitar is out whipping up a sandstorm, so we no longer gain the benefit from our leftovers. Plus four stab four times super effective Brick Break deletes the Gen 2 pseudo. My favorite turn in this entire video is about to happen. I use Rock Slide against Executor, but miss the one shot, leaving him at a sliver. Our decoy absorbs his sleep powder, and then the weather that he started knocks out his Executor. Sometimes, everyone, you just have to take a moment to appreciate the little things. Rock Slide takes out Alakazam, then outspeeding and doing more four times super effective damage, we take down Charizard. Heracross's rampage continues with one more Rock Slide taking down Gyarados in the back after a miss. We are now the round two champions. Although Heracross lost the race today, I could not have asked for a better opponent. They're so different and yet so similar. This was a close race. Heracross clocks in with a round two time of one hour, 27 minutes, and 12 seconds at level 73 with 10 resets. This took five hours and 20 minutes of game time. We'll compare each Pokémon individually to see their improvement between runs before showing the race results. Scizor did fantastic, gaining 24 seconds in the Brock split, but solving that Rival 2 battle gave us a 5.5 minute lead early after Misty. It's a trend that continued all through the game, seeing a little fluctuation in the mid-game because of the early grinding that we did. This resulted in gaining over 15 minutes by the end of the Round 1 League, culminating with a 20 minutes and 11 second time save at the end of round two, four levels lower with 23 less resets and 30 minutes less game time. Finding our way through the rival's ace, that was the key. Heracross, as it turns out, had an incredibly lucky first split with Brock. We lost 1 minute and 11 seconds against him, regaining it almost entirely by Misty at least. Something weird was going on with Heracross though, I don't know if my altered routing actually helped him that much. He played so intuitively in the early sections of the game that I found myself wondering, was this the better way? We're almost 4 minutes behind our first playthrough entering the round 1 league, but with a lot more grinding under our belt. It resolved in a 1 minute and 39 second time gain in the round 1 league, then finishing round 2 12 minutes and 10 seconds faster at the same level with 30 less resets. We even finished with one more minute of game time. I feel the time saves were almost entirely from switching to substrats and not wiping a bunch in the round 2 league. 
Comparing the two against each other, this was an amazing race. I've included the leader's time splits with their times progressing through the first eight badges, not necessarily in the same order. As you can see in the second playthrough, Scizor led for the majority of the game, but this was close. Close enough that when the two were finishing the gym challenge, they were only a second apart. I feel that having the higher level and better setup move for both leagues, though, gave Scizor the edge it needed to overcome Heracross. Gosh, this was a lot of fun. On the tier list, this wedges both of our competitors into the cluster of pseudos. It's interesting that every Pokémon in the B tier was a physical attacker with roughly the same base attack and access to a setup move. Heracross finds himself between Dragonite and Tyranitar, and Scizor actually edges out Metagross, finishing one second faster. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. You help make this content possible and help keep me motivated to continue working hard and bringing you the best possible content that I can. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. We made it everyone! Last week I posted a poll asking all of you what you wanted to see next. This video won the poll and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you all for casting your votes. I have some solo runs planned in the upcoming weeks, but we'll be producing Arbok vs. Seviper soon with a follow-up Zangoose run as requested. I also hope that you enjoyed the new Gym Leader intros and time comparison graphics. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. I have big plans and lots to do, so let's wrap this up. If you feel like I've earned it, you can show your support by leaving a like and comment about the runs, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Welcome! As we've demonstrated one more time in this video, substrats best strats, so if you'd like to keep up with my content, hit that subscribe button and enable notifications to never miss an upload, or poll that I release in the future. I love the feedback from all of you. It really helps my channel to continue growing. Until next time, take care everyone.